Welcome everyone, Questine here with a discussion about AI aggression against the player, the anti-player bias that does exist in the game and that we've all dealt with. But I do want to explain it to the best of my ability based on things that I've noticed playing quite a lot of campaigns in Immortal Empires. Like let's uh, say, let's take the situation, you're playing a campaign, you get the Sentinels and in comes Greases. This hasn't happened here, but in an Emmerich campaign I was doing, I took the Sentinels, then I moved on, and then just Greases declared war on me. Which he might do so in this campaign, or he might have done so had Gorse not wiped him out. But it certainly was a pretty good possibility. But there is a very solid enough explanation for why these kind of things do happen. Now, one of the reasons it happens is because of aversion. So if we look at Greases on the diplomacy screen, he has a minus 20 aversion against me. He also probably is not necessarily too fond of the fact that uh, he probably wouldn't be too fond of the fact uh, if I start selling ter territory to Gorst to have uh, a good deal with him. Though I haven't done that in this campaign. I haven't engaged in diplomacy with Gorst at all. Sure, I could go over here, get the defensive alliance right off the bat by selling pig barter to Gorst. But the natural outcome of that would be that Greases would be pissed off and he would likely attack if he saw the opportunity to do so. The AI is all about opportunism. The AI will always seek out weak points against each other even. This kind of behavior also happens against each other. The AI will see, seek out weak points against their opponents or seek out opponents that they think are going to be weak enough and try and destroy them. So in the in the case of Greases, the weak point of course that he could go for very easily in this campaign would be the Sentinels because it doesn't have an army in there. The garrison is the default one. So he could potentially easily take and easily take it out now if i started getting worse relations with him so for instance if i sell pig barter uh, to gorst over here then greases as you might imagine just isn't gonna uh, appreciate that in fact my diplomatic relations with him are gonna go down significantly from minus 19 to minus 57 and if i sell more territory to gorst he is very, very, very likely to declare war on me. But this is something you can predict in a certain way. So the AI always looks for opportunity and it also will more usually go for factions that it hates. So since Greases already has a decent uh, negative level of aversion uh, with me and right now I just saw Pig Barter to, uh, to Gorst, He's quite very likely, if he gets that ability without, um, without Gorst wiping him out, he would uh, obviously declare war on me. And if he has an army primed and ready to go against the Sentinels, he will do so. Then there's, of course, Grimgor Ironhide over here, uh, even further to the north. The moment he gets the opportunity to attack me is the moment he will do so, because he utterly despises me and because he might see me as an easy pecking. But there's more to, to this than just uh, having a settlement like the Sentinels that is exposed against your enemies. There's quite a lot more in point of fact. See, the AI makes decision making, its decision making based, based on strength ranking. The stronger you are as a faction, the less likely fa other factions are to declare war on you when they are uh, at the peak of their strength. Very weak factions that have been completely wiped out, significantly weakened, they might declare war, but it's kind of like a last ditch effort, a desperate effort when they're about to be wiped out because they know they're gonna be finished. They might as well throw all they can in a fight and try and prevail against their enemies. So having a high strength ranking is important in a campaign. Having high strength rank ranking means having powerful armies. But I think, uh, but I also think it's not just the strength ranking, though that is a representation of it. I also think the AI is aware of how strong it can be against you in particular. See, the AI at high difficulties gets various benefits. Even from normal, it gets benefits, income benefits, growth benefits, replenishment benefits, recruit slot benefits, you, can, you name it. So the AI is always going to generate more money than you 
It's always going to have more armies than you. It's going to be able to at least theoretically grow its settlements faster than you on pretty much every difficulty except easy in the game. That means the AI is advancing quicker than you. Um, like the AI may grow its settlement. If you leave the AI to grow its settlements, it will surpass you partly because they have the money for it and partly because they have the ridiculous growth. Like ogres, for instance, with their camps, uh, like ogre camps for... Um, for the AI controlled ogres will reach a, va a higher um, higher level quicker, much quicker than player camps, even on this kind of, uh, uh, even on normal uh, difficulty. But in higher difficulties, because the AI gets so many more resources compared to the player, then obviously has more resources, has more armies. And I do believe that that is factored in, not just, uh, not just purely represented by the strength ranking it might also matter what the overall strength ranking of a faction is so if you have a faction like Rimgor who can reach uh, rank one very very easily or or uh, you know low cure or others that reach a high strength ranking then they might not even care about the strength ranking at all or care about the very little because if they're the dominant faction they just will see everyone as the weaker target but why go after the player specifically well the AI does exhibit this behavior against other AI factions, but certainly there is a tendency to go after the player. But that's because you, you as the player, you don't have that kind of power. Um, you aren't so strong. You aren't as strong as the AI in the sense that you don't get as uh, you you don't get any benefits, and your strength ranking might be weaker. And on top of that, because of the nature of auto resolve, especially on higher difficulties, if you're auto resolving a bell and taking substantial casualties, well, that's going to affect uh, your strength rank ranking, which in turn is going to affect the AI's perception uh, against you. It might also have to do with uh, the diplomacy factor. Like if you're at war with a bunch of factions, then other factions might just decide to pile on you. But basically, the way the reason the AI bias exists is because, yeah, the player doesn't have the benefits, and the AI is just going to look at that and see it as an opportunity to freely expand uh, across territory and easily take out the player. That's the reason the, the AI is aggressive against the player specifically, because as players, we obviously don't get all the wonderful benefits. Our settlements won't be as high levels, which means they're easier targets as well. Like, it's, it takes longer for us to grow our settlements than the major AI factions. Um, and yet, if you play a faction that can achieve a very high strength ranking very quickly, like, uh, say, Grimgor, for instance, or Kolek, or some other faction, then you might notice that the declarations of war are going to be far fewer. Unless it's the kind of declarations of war from factions that don't stand any chance against you, or they're the kind of declarations of war that happen purely because you're uh, hated uh, by a lot of factions. Like, the Greenskins have a significant amount of aversion against everyone, pretty much, or the vast majority of factions that do exist in the game. Like, they can get along well with Skaven somewhat, uh, a couple of other factions, but many other factions do, do despise the Greenskins. And it's such a level of a version that it might end up being more significant in the AI's decision making than anything else. One of the things I've noticed in a campaign is you can tackle a version up to minus 40 just fine and actually have a long lasting solid alliance with the faction that has a minus 40 or thereabouts a version against you. But at minus 100, which for instance Greenskins may have quite a lot of factions, that's where things get dicey. You could still get a temporary alliance with another faction in your campaign, but maintaining it is going to be pretty brutal because that minus 100 version is going to make it very, very difficult for that relationship to last. It's what I've noticed. It's like I can play entire campaigns. I have factions that have minus 40 aversion, but yet I can ma still maintain a very good, solid, productive relationship between myself and AI that will last the entire campaign. But if it's minus 100 aversion, unlikely to do so, uh, very unlikely uh, to, to do so. So that's uh, kind of some of the things you should know with regards to this, but how do you deal with this? Uh, what, uh, what's the situation? Well, let's say for instance, I don't want Greasis over here as Drasif to declare war on me. Well, 
you can take a risk, and it is a risk to do it. But one of the things you can do in this situation is you can decide to not engage with Gorse. Now, the problem, of course, with that is that Gorse does dislike you quite immensely because you have a minus 40 aversion. Uh, you have a minus 40 aversion from him. So, uh, Gorst, if he starts winning this situation, becoming dominant, it might end up in a situation where he just declares war on you. But usually speaking, right, usually speaking, not engaging diplomatically with their enemies, um, like not giving them territory, not getting money from their enemies or factions they hate, that's also a thing. Greasus and Gorst do hate each other. Um, so not engaging diplomatically with those factions is actually pretty uh, is something that can avoid you ending up in a lot of pain and misery. For instance, let's say I'm playing as Kislev and I decide to engage diplomatically with Rika. I sell her some territory. Well, the natural outcome of that is that Azak, who also wants that territory and doesn't like Rika, is going to end up declaring war on me. What I've discovered playing as Katrin, for instance, that the best thing you can do to avoid having both Rika or, uh, or either of them coming for you uh, in, in attacking your territory, the best way to avoid getting entangled in a war with either Draco or Isaac or both is to not engage at all with Ostromark. But why is that? Well, both Draco and Isaac hate the Ostromark. If you start trading with the Ostromark, they're going to dislike it. You could go to war with the Ostromark and they might actually like you a bit more for that. But then there's another issue. Of course, they both want the Ostromark. Uh, Draco wants the Ostromark because of her wood growth. Isaac wants it because I believe it's his victory conditions. And the AI is scripted in such a way that certain territories they will want to take uh, regardless. And if you take those territories ahead of them, then they're likely going to declare war on you. Uh, so, so for instance, Ungram over here, he always wants a silver pinnacle. It does seem like uh, Azak is just going to wipe out Ungram in this particular situation. That rarely happens, I might add. Uh, but it is something uh, worth knowing. It seems like Skarsnik is, it's one of, this is one of those very weird situations where, like, both the major dwarf factions over here have been uh, wiped out. But if you take the territory they want, like the silver pinnacle, which Ungram wants, let's say you're playing Azak, you take that out, or you're playing the castle, or if you take that, obviously the version that they have that Ungram already has towards you is very high. But if you do that, then the chances of war are guaranteed uh, as well. So you need to know what territory a faction wants. Like Tretch, for instance, will almost certainly declare war on Drazov because I think Tretch does want to take the Darkhold, or he wants to take the, this territory. Though you can avoid it for a good amount of time, or you can avoid it maybe completely with, with respect to that. It isn't something completely unavoidable, but it obviously depends on other factors, as, uh, but, but because it depends on other factors as well. Now, on um, now, on top of that, uh, now on top of that, you should always also have a campaign plan where you're expanding in such a way that you're not leaving enemies at your back. So, for instance, as a Drazov campaign, you know that Emric is very likely going to declare war on you. He may not do it instantly. He may not do it early game. He may take his time. But when he sees the opportunity to attack you, let's say you start moving your armies from the initial province, you move them north, you deal with Tretch, you're leaving your back completely exposed to Emric. He is going to take advantage of that situation. And it's something you need to be aware of. So, for instance, if you're playing a Drazov campaign, the first thing you want to do is actually, once you take it in your entire province, maybe get the non-aggression pack to it uh, with uh, Tretch and then just go wipe Emric with ex extreme prejudice. And that also, like the Thunder Guts over here, they might also sense an opportunity to attack you. Gorse might sen sense an opportunity to attack you. This is what makes some of these starting positions pretty damn hard, is because you are surrounded by factions that uh, that don't like you. And when they sense the opportunity, when they don't have something going on for themselves, they might attack you. Uh, another thing is with regards to the AI's war. So, for instance, Grimgore over here, what makes them so very de deadly dangerous for every faction is that, although in this case it does seem like he's a, he's, a, he's a war with Kolek, uh, but what makes Grimgore so, so very dangerous um, as an AI faction is he only starts a war with these ogres. And once he wipes them out, he can pick and choose who he's going to declare war. Based on everything I said, like how you're weaker than the AI, how you don't have the economy, how you don't have, which translates into having the armies, how you might have your flanks exposed, 
if you encounter Grimgor um, uh, before he declares war on anyone else, uh, then he's likely going to declare war on you because you're weaker than him, you don't have the economic output, he's very strong, and so he, he's going to decide who he's going to declare war on. He might declare war on other factions, or other factions might declare war on him. Obviously, things can happen in multiple ways, but it is worth, uh, worth bearing in mind how these things can develop during the course uh, of the campaign and why they develop as well. That's all there is to say. Costine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.